church. Hey, there we go. You guys are catching on. All right. Here we go. One more time. All right. So good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, so what a great opportunity we have to come before the Lord this morning and serve Him by being here and by witnessing to others. And maybe there's someone in the booth today that you haven't seen in a while. So as we look around and we greet people and we're, you know, we have our own little friend groups within our church. And everybody, knows, everybody does this. You know, we, we tend to kind of gravitate towards, you know, individual people. I would like to encourage you this morning to look around and find someone that you haven't seen in a while or maybe a new place. And just go to them and let them know uh, how much that you uh, appreciate them being here or you're glad to see them back. Or maybe, uh, you know, it's their first time here. Just make them feel welcome this morning in a way that you feel safe doing that. So just want everybody to know that it's great to see your face this morning. My name is Jeff, and as always, it's an honor to stand here on the stage and sing these songs and just to, just to lead in this worship time. And uh, as always, it's an honor to be here. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. All right, so how many people in the room are going to help me do that this morning? Amen? All right, so we got five. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'll take it. All right, so and uh, uh, if you will, let's stand together. And uh, we're going to ask the Lord to come and have the praises of his people this morning. Because without him being here, we're just making more. You know, we can do that anyway. But right here in this place this morning, we want the spirit of the Holy God to be here. To usher in the presence of the Lord this morning. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for just who you are. Thank you for being God. Because we can. Thank you for this place that we have to come and worship you. Thank you for the efforts that are that are put forward here to make this place uh, something that's worthy. And I pray that everything that we do here will be pleasing to you. And as we come before you this morning, God, in all of our faults, I pray that you would forgive us of those things. Help us to come before you as clean and as, as righteous as we can, even though we can't do that on our own. Pray your blessings over that this morning. Pray your blessings over every note that's played, every word that's spoken, every word that's sung this morning. Pray for Brother Ryan as he brings the message this morning. I pray that you would pour into him exactly what you would have us to hear. He would, he would pour that out into us. And we would accept those things and apply those things to our lives. So that we can take those things out into our workplace, in our school through our social life, whatever that looks like for us for the rest of the week. God. Pray that we take those things that we learn here today and we go and we make much of Jesus. And all these things I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so can you do this with me this morning? Can you clap along with us this morning? Would you be able to do that? Yes. 
soul Now your freedom is all that I know continue our worship this morning. So blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be 
Amen. Congregation, you may be seated.
Amen. Amen. Let's give him all the glory and honor he deserves. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Oh, His holy name, sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. children can be dismissed to Children's Church. And for everybody else, open your Bibles to the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 20 will be our sermon text today, Exodus 20.
It's only a coincidence that as I'm preaching from Exodus that they happen to be having an exodus. God is good, amen? Amen. You know, the other night I had a dream that I was a muffler, and I woke up very exhausted. Do you know what else? Do you know what else? I have to give a second for that one. Do you know what else is exhausting? Trying to be good all the time. Isn't that exhausting? Trying to act like you have it all together when you might be one little thing away from having a meltdown. Have you ever been there? Isn't that exhausting? It really is. But when you look at the Bible, and our sermon text is going to be Matthew chapter 20, you run into some of these verses in the Bible that just speak to your very need. And I love it when the Bible does that. In Matthew chapter 11, just listen to this. You don't have to turn to it. Matthew 11, verse 28. It says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now that's a great verse. So what I see from that is, We have gone through a lot of mess over the past year, haven't we? And isn't it good to hear that Jesus can come in and he says, I want to give you rest. And I want you to understand that my burden is light. And so I don't know where you are right now. All of us are in different places. And you might have a very busy and burdened heart right now. But God has a message for you. And this message is for us to have rest. God has led me to do a study of the Ten Commandments to show that we can have rest, not more burdens. We need the rest of the Lord. We need peace of mind. And these Ten Commandments reveal God's heart that he has for his people. And so if you look at these Ten Commandments and you just say, hey, they're just a bunch of a list of things I got to do and don't got to do and all this other kind of stuff, you're missing the point. What God is doing in these Ten Commandments is he's showing you He's showing you how much he loves you. And he's given these commandments as ways to show you that you are a prized possession. He's showing us how we can have rest as we walk in obedience to these commandments. And so let's start with Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 2. You don't need to jump into the list of the ten without reading these two verses first. These first two verses are really the backdrop to everything that follows. And it starts with verse 1, Exodus 20, verse 1. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Father, we love you today. And as we look at this text today, I pray that you would just open our eyes to see the wonderful things that are in your word And God, this is an important time for us to study this important passage of Scripture. And I pray, God, that you would just give us rest because we are so desperately needing rest right now. We're worn out. We're exhausted from everything that's been going on in our world, and we just need to see the meek and lowly Christ. And I pray today, Lord, as you speak to our hearts, that we would be utterly obedient, that every fiber and every cell of our being would say, yes, Lord, that there would be no hesitation, that there would be no excuses, that we would do whatever you would have us to do, because you, you're a holy God. And I pray, God, that as we see how you have revealed yourself, that we would come to know you that we would recognize your voice and recognize that this is a voice that is utterly passionate for us. God, do great work here. And I pray your anointing would be on me as I proclaim your truth today. And I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So in this study of the Ten Commandments, as we're studying, I just want to start with two questions today. Two questions. The first question is this. Why are the Ten Commandments important? Why are the Ten Commandments important? And then the second question is going to be, how does it relate to Christians? 
But let's look at this first question. Why are the Ten Commandments important? There are four ways that I want to share with you that the Ten Commandments are important. The first of which is that the law reveals God's character. When you study the Ten Commandments, you see things about God. We're not learning about a list of things we should do and shouldn't do, but we're also learning about who God is. And I want you to understand that as we come to understand who God is, God changes our hearts. We have a new perspective on his word. We have a new perspective on what it means to be part of the church and even our own lives. You see, if we come to recognize how holy God is and how great God is, how could we go back to life as we used to live it? So what I'm going to share with you are four character traits that we see from the fact that God reveals God's character. To begin with, God's law shows that he is gracious. If you look at the beginning there of verse 1, it says this, And God spoke all these words, saying... Now, from that short little verse, I think it's important to understand that whenever God speaks, it is called revelation. God is revealing himself to his people. And so God is revealing himself to his people for one specific purpose. That is, so that we would have a relationship with him. And so when God speaks, he speaks from grace. He doesn't have to speak to us. God is holy and God is sovereign, and it is by his grace that he shares anything with us. But yet God here is speaking. And so when God speaks, we understand who he is. We understand he is a gracious God. Now we need to start listening because this is not the opinion of a newscaster. This is not just a, something that is popular. This is a God that is speaking. And he's revealing something to us, so we need to pay attention. He is gracious. We also see that God's law shows that he is merciful. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 33, Did any people ever hear the voice of a God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and still live? God is merciful. He had redeemed Israel from physical slavery to show that they need to be redeemed from spiritual slavery. They were slaves to their sin. And all of the delivery that he had done from Egypt was to illustrate that there is a great God that can also rescue them from their sin. Everything God did was to point them to the fact that they need a relationship with him and that there's no hope outside of him. They deserve death for their sin. But God provided a way in these Ten Commandments to show them that they need a Savior. And we're going to look at that here in a little bit, how the Ten Commandments do that. And so what God is doing is he's giving them mercy. Rather than immediate judgment and death, God comes forth and shows that he is a merciful God. But there's a third thing we learn about God's character. Not only is he gracious and merciful, God's law also shows that he is good. We love to say God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, right? But sometimes that second part we say a little quieter, <laughs> because that all the time is difficult sometimes, isn't it? But his words for us are always for our good. It may not always feel like it's for our good, but it's like medicine and food for our soul. Psalm 119 speaks of the goodness of the word of God. When God speaks, he reveals the greatest and most important knowledge that any human can ever hear. This is a God that reveals himself to us. Everything that God does is good. And we see in Romans 8, 28, that God works together all things for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God tells us not to do things in order to protect us. You remember the story in Genesis in Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3, God had created everything, had created the Garden of Eden, had placed Adam and Eve in there, and he said, all of this you can enjoy, but stay away from that tree. Stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, "You, if you eat of that tree, it has consequences. You will die. Enjoy everything else, but stay away from that. Now, when God told them to stay away from that, was he holding out on them? No. 
God was saying, I love you so much, right here is dangerous, you need to stay away so you are protected. He was warning them. Whenever we break God's commandments, it is called sin. And sin always leads to hurt and broken relationships. Sometimes we, as a church, we think so much about the eternal, and it's good to think about the eternal. We think about how sin separates us from God and how we can't go to heaven on our own because of sin. But here's what I think we sometimes miss. Sin has temporary consequences as well. Some of you are dealing with shame and guilt and brokenness in relationships because you have unconfessed sin in your life. And we need to get rid of that. We need to confess it to the Lord. God's law shows that he is a good, good God. But we also see this fourth characteristic of God is that God's law shows that he is a holy God. He is a holy God. The word holy speaks of the fact that he is pure. And he is separate from sin. Exodus chapter 19 is the backdrop to Israel being at Mount Sinai when God is going to reveal these Ten Commandments to Moses and then eventually to the people. But this entire chapter is about the fact that he is a holy God. And, and I'm not going to take time to read the whole chapter by any means, but take verse 4, for example. It says there, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. You see, God shows his power over the Egyptians. He compared his delivering out of the people of Israel from Egypt, he compared that to an eagle and then flying on the back of an eagle. It's a beautiful picture. I don't know if you've thought of this before, that when there's a baby eagle and they're learning how to fly, they're called eaglets, right? I believe that's correct. So these, these eagles are, are learning how to fly. And as they are struggling and learning how to fly, the mother eagle will be right under them. So if they fall, if they, if they can't get, catch the wind the right way, the mother is always there to continue that pathway. So they are continually growing, continually learning. And God is saying here that I am like that eagle. I'm going to guide you to a good life, but you have to trust me. God is holy in his power that he shows in Exodus 19, 5 through 6. We see even further, it says there, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So here we see that God has a purpose for Israel. He didn't just save them and say, okay, I'll see you when you die. But he wanted them to be a holy people. We see his holiness further displayed in Exodus 19, 10 and 11, and also 14 and 15, where God had commanded them to be consecrated and to be clean before they receive God's word. In Exodus 19, 12 through 13, God had set boundaries around the mountain and said, if there is any person or animal that touches that mountain where my presence is, they will immediately die. God is a holy God. And then listen to this description in Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 through 19. I want to read these verses. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. What an amazing description here. They shuddered at the sight and sounds at the mountain so that they would learn to fear God. That is, they're going to take God seriously. You don't take God as someone that's just making recommendations or suggestions. You understand that this is a holy God. Look at the words it describes the fact that there were thunders and lightnings and earthquakes and a thick cloud of smoke. God came down upon the mountain in fire. When he spoke, it was like the voice of thunder. Everybody is shaking and trembling at his presence. He's a holy God. 
He is a holy God. And then we see in Exodus chapter 20, in the opening verses here, God speaking to his people. And so when God speaks, he's not merely giving knowledge or information or recommendations about how you need to live a healthy life. This is a holy God, and all of his words are holy words, and his words are commands. They're not options, whether you're going to weigh them and say, well, I'll do this or do this. Which one's going to be better for me? We say, you're God, and you are always the one I need to obey. He is the ultimate authority. His word needs to be revered, treasured, and obeyed. And so from this opening verse, we see that the law reveals God's character. He is gracious, he's merciful, he is good, and he is also holy. But secondly, we see that the law sets God's standard. If you look at Exodus 20, verse 2, it continues there. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God is a holy God, and his voice sets absolutes. He does not change his mind. So no matter how much time passes, God's law, God's rules are still in effect. The Bible says that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Even throughout all eternity, God's word will still stand. Just think for a minute of how temporary things are how everything fades away, how nothing seems to last. God's word will still last. So no matter what our culture says, no matter how much our culture will evolve, God's word still stands, and we shouldn't even question that. Just as God is holy, he demands that his people live lives that reflect his holiness. God had set Israel free, had redeemed Israel from Egypt, so that they would be a lighthouse to all the other nations. All the other nations were bowing down to things made out of stone, things made out of wood, things that they had made with their own hands. Those idols didn't talk. Those idols didn't walk. Those idols didn't do anything whatsoever. And it broke God's heart that people were worshiping those things. And so God set apart Israel and said, go win the nations, live a holy life, tell them about the one true God. And yet... In many cases, they failed. God wanted them to walk in loving obedience to their God and introduce the nations to the God above all other gods. And so as we look at these Ten Commandments, you don't need to look at them as a to-do list, a checkmark list. Well, I got that one pretty good. I got that one pretty good. Eh, struggling on that one, but I'll get to it later, right? This is... Not a to-do list, but really it is a description of God's standard. So what percentage of these Ten Commandments do we need to keep? 50%? 75%? Isn't that good? That's pretty good, right? Get a passing grade, maybe? <laughs> the answer to that is this question. How holy is God? How holy is God? And that tells us how many of these commandments we need to keep. God is perfectly holy, and it tells us in Matthew 5, 48, Jesus said this in his Sermon on the Mount, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So the standard is perfection. The standard is perfection here, and none of us are perfect. If we're to have a relationship with God and have the hope of eternal life in heaven, we have to keep all of these Ten Commandments absolutely perfectly. Do you understand that? So some of you might be here today saying, oh, I'm a pretty good person. I'm better than so-and-so. I think I'm a pretty moral guy. I'm not as bad as those people in jail and all these other kinds of things. What we're doing is we change the standard in order to make it feel right for us. God says perfection, 100% obedience is the standard. And if you fall short of that, you've missed the standard and there are consequences. And so what we say instead is, well, instead of comparing myself to God, I'll compare myself to others. You can always find somebody that you think is worse than you. We think that God has some holy scale in heaven, and as long as our deeds, our good deeds outweigh our evil deeds, that God will say, come on in, 51 over 49. That was a close one, but come on into heaven. But the Bible tells us 
And it's very important that we see this, that the wages of our sin is death. And so if we're not perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, we will not go to heaven. We do not have eternal life. No matter how moral you are, no matter how much of an upstanding citizen you think you are, and that leads us to this third point, that the law sets God's standard, but it also exposes our sinfulness. Have you ever tried cutting a steak with a spoon? It doesn't work, right? And the reason it doesn't work is because spoons are not designed for that. The law never saved anybody of the Old Testament or anybody else. No one that is in heaven or ever will go to heaven has been saved because they kept God's law or because they were good people. It was never designed to save. In fact, Paul later would say in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, I think this verse is so significant. It says, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Now, do you know what he's saying there? He's saying that if we could be good enough, then Jesus did not have to die. If it only took 25% obedience to the Ten Commandments to go to heaven, why did Jesus have to die then? Jesus died because none of us are good enough. Jesus died because all of us have broken the commandment. Jesus died because all of us deserve death. So the law does not save, but it does expose our sinfulness, our wicked motives, and our rebellion against the God that is holy. The Apostle Paul would call the law a schoolmaster in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. He also said this in Romans 7, 7. I think this is an important verse to consider. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. And so we know we're breaking the law. Have you ever been out on the highway and you ask your uh, passenger, hey, what's the speed limit? Well, I don't, I don't know what the speed limit is. Just go what feels right. So you, you start going what feels right. I don't know if your passenger would say that or not. But then you notice one of those white signs with the big number. Or maybe it's one of those blinking lights that's turned red. And you said, oh, I was breaking the law there. I was going faster than I should have been going. And so the law works that way. We don't know that we're coveting except that God says, do not covet. And so when we recognize that we have coveted, we recognize that we have sinned. And thus we're pointed to the fact that we're falling short of God's glory. And that leads to this fourth point why the law is so important. It exposes our sinfulness, but our sinfulness in the law pointing us, it should point us to a savior. God's word from cover to cover is about Jesus Christ. Even the Old Testament points to our need for a redeemer. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the law. There is not one of the Ten Commandments that Jesus disobeyed ever. Just think about that for a minute. There is never a point where Jesus put anything other than God the Father in his heart. There is never a point where Jesus lied or stole or coveted or committed adultery or dishonored his parents. Jesus never, ever sinned. He perfectly loved God. He perfectly loved his neighbors. And the law shows us our sinfulness, and the Spirit draws us to the only one who can give us salvation, that is Jesus. Listen to Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, and then verse 13 here in a minute. Verse 10, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So did you get that? If you don't obey every single one of the Ten Commandments perfectly, the Bible says that you're cursed. But it also says that Jesus became a curse for us so that we could be set free, so that we could have life. By faith, we are declared righteous in God's sight because of the righteous, the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For our sakes he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then in Romans 10, 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so God calls us to repent. And repentance is turning away from ourselves turning to God, turning away from our sins and turning to the Lord. But it also is recognizing that there is no good within us and that we need a Savior. Listen to me now. It's not Jesus plus going to church, Jesus plus baptism, Jesus plus being a pretty good guy. It's Jesus alone that saves us. He had said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so the law, as we see here, it reveals God's character. It sets God's standard. It exposes our own sinfulness, but it points us to a Savior. But God does not force us to be saved. We have to receive his free gift. And so as you read the Bible and you read these Ten Commandments, you're going to see you are not perfectly fulfilling these Ten Commandments because you are a sinner, because I'm a sinner. I have disobeyed every single one of these commands. And here's the thing. God says, yes, you're a sinner, but I still love you, and there's a Savior. So that leads me to the second question. How does a Christian relate to the Ten Commandments? We look at this and sometimes people point at it and say, oh, it's just Old Testament stuff. It's the law. Now we're under grace. And so we don't even need to think about that. We don't even need to study that. But listen to me, there are four vital truths about how a Christian relates to the Ten Commandments. Number one, as Christians, we look beyond the external. We look beyond the external. God's law is still authoritative and it is necessary And Jesus showed us on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5-7, through that the law applies not only to external behaviors, but it also applies to our hearts, to the intentions of our hearts. Jesus had said, if you're angry, it's like you've committed murder in your heart. Jesus had said, if you lust after a woman, it's like you've committed adultery in your heart. So it's not just about, well, I've never done the act. Well, how's your heart? Obedience involves more than just going through the motions. Jesus taught that obedience concerns the very core of a person. So to obey God, the sinner needs a new heart. Which brings us to Ezekiel 36, verses 26 through 28. The goal is that we just don't try harder, but listen to what this passage says. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. This passage is a prediction and prophecy of a new covenant. And so the law is not irrelevant now, but God says you can fulfill the law as you trust in Christ. And then the law is not about self-righteousness. It's not about external rituals, but it's about a delight. You obey the law because you love the Savior. The reason why we follow the Ten Commandments, the reason why we do what God wants us to do is not because I better do it or God's going to strike me dead or I'm going to go to hell if I disobey one little fraction of the law. But no, we do the law because we love our Jesus. We obey him. We please our Savior. But then we also imitate God's character. And just as Israel was summoned to be a lighthouse, so every Christian has been saved redeemed in order to shine and be a light to the lost people around you. Israel was to be a light to their neighbors. You are to be a light to your neighbors. Israel was to be a light to the nations. You are to be a light to the nations. And if you're not being obedient to God, your little light is not shining very brightly. 1 Peter chapter 1, God had simply said through Peter, Be holy as I am holy. 
Live a life of purity. Live a life separated from sin as the new heart that God has given you through the Holy Spirit. Live that out. Thirdly, a third way we relate to the Ten Commandments is that we love God and we love people. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 36, Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he answered with one word, and that one word is love. He quoted Deuteronomy 6, 5, which is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. That verse summarizes the first four commandments. The first four commandments are vertical. They deal with your love relationship with God. But then he also quoted Leviticus 19, 18. That says, love your neighbor as yourself. And that verse is a summary of the latter six commandments, five through 10, deal with how you love others, how you love your neighbor. And so if you obeyed all the Ten Commandments, you would perfectly love God and you would perfectly love your neighbor. Several years ago, there was a campaign, WWJD, what would Jesus do? They had the t-shirts and the coffee mugs and the bracelets, and it was a, a big selling point. I don't know if it really changed anyone's life or not. I have no idea. But another good ethic, another good question that you could ask, should I do this? Think about this question. Does that action love God? I don't have a good acronym for it. D-T-A-L-G. Well, you think that'll sell? Maybe I can make some bracelets or something. I don't know. Does that action love God? Does that action love your neighbor? Are you showing the love of Christ by doing, by saying, whatever it is that you're doing or saying? You see, we love God and we love people as we follow the Lord. And a fourth and final way that it pertains to the Christian is that we cherish Christ's cross. As we reflect on Jesus' perfect obedience, we see his absolute innocence, which is awe-inspiring. But we also see our absolute guilt. Because it's not as though we're having a passing grade here. We are very low on the scale. We have not only broken these laws, we have shattered them and spat upon them and looked at them with scorn and said, I will not obey that. I will rebel against that. Who are you, God, to tell me what to do? That's what we have all done. Yet, Jesus went to the cross and paid the penalty for that very attitude. Every sin that we have committed warranted an eternal death of separation from God forever, but yet Jesus paid it in full. He said, it is finished when it is on the cross, which means I don't have to work my way for salvation. I don't have to do penance. I don't have to go to purgatory. I don't have to give money to the church hoping that God will notice those zeros and say, hey, come on in. It doesn't work like that. It is finished because of the cross of Christ. So how can we not stand in awe of this Jesus? How can we not worship him with all of our hearts and souls? He has paid the debt that we owed because he loved us. Do you not see his mercy there? Do you not see his grace there? And as you see that mercy and you see that grace, you see that love, you just stand back and you say, how can it be? How can it be a sinner that has been so rebellious and so evil against the holy God, but yet you love me and you gave yourself for me? How can that be? We cherish Christ's cross. That's what the law leads us to do. You see, God gave the commands to Israel after he had redeemed them from slavery. And the important thing for us to note and question ourselves is this. Have you been redeemed from sin slavery? The Bible talks about the fact that we are all sinners and we deserve death for our sins. But remember, like I said there, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He paid the penalty for your sins. But you have to believe. You have to receive his free gift. No one is saved today just by going through a religious motion, coming to church, giving money, or, or trying to be good. You are saved by placing your faith and trust in Jesus and in Jesus Christ alone. He came to be a curse for us because we were all cursed because of our disobedience. That's what Jesus did. Receive his gift. 
Repent of your sin. Come before God and say, God, there's no way I'm good enough. There's no way I could save myself. But God, I need you today. So God, save me today. And God will save you. But no one is ever saved that thinks it's Jesus plus. You have to come and say, Christ and Christ alone. That's the only way I can be saved. So I want to invite you today to receive his free gift. You don't have to work for it. It is absolutely free. And some of you today, you know that you're saved, but the weight of the world is on you. You're exhausted from trying to be a good Christian and trying to do good things. Jesus is calling you today to enter into his rest. Let him live through you. If you have trusted him with your soul, will you trust him in your day-to-day life? Repent of your sin surrender. Trust in him today. God has given you these commands, not as a checklist, but for you to have a vibrant relationship with him as you allow him to live through you. So we're going to have a time of response and invite you to come. Let me pray, and then we will respond to Jesus. Father, this is your time. Work in every heart here today. You are a holy God who has spoken, and we cannot brush that under the rug and think it's unimportant. God, if there's someone here that needs to be saved, I pray that you would just show them that they're a sinner, but there is a Savior. And I pray today that they would receive Jesus and be saved today. And I pray for those that know that they're saved, I pray that they would be able to have rest and peace in their heart, knowing that you have paid it all. And I pray that that would fill them with joy. God, you're so gracious to even speak to us. And I pray we would respond in faith. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a time of response. I want to invite our musicians and praise team to come forward. Counselors can come over here to this door. For everybody else, God has spoken. God has revealed himself to us. He is gracious. He is merciful. He is good and he is holy. But how are you going to respond to him? See, this time of response is a time for you to come and respond to his word. If you need to respond right where you are, maybe the music's playing, you don't need to sing, and you need to pray, you can get on your knees right where you are. These altars are open if you need to come and pray for yourself or for anybody else. That's what this time of response is for. If you know that you need to be saved, you recognize that you're a sinner, and you see that Jesus is the only Savior, you can also come forward. We'd be glad to share with you how today you could be redeemed, you could be set free. Maybe others of you have questions about joining the church, and you can come forward and ask those at this time. But as we have this time of response, the Holy God has spoken. How are you going to respond? Let's stand together, and as Jeff and the praise team lead us, be obedient to the Lord Jesus. From wherever you've been, come broken heart and then rescued again. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burden. Yeah.
So lay down your hood, lay down your heart, come as you are, come as you are, fall in His arms, come as you are. No sorrow, heaven can't do. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can't do. Lay down your burden. Praise God. Go ahead and be seated just for a moment if you don't mind. Praise God. God is so, so good and uh, so grateful to be in the house of the Lord with you today. Hope you've been blessed. Have you been blessed? Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Listen, we have these new worship guides. I don't know if everybody's aware of them. Each Sunday, as you're coming into the door, we have a little black stand on both sides, and they have these one-page worship guides. On the front, you'll see some pertinent announcements, church-wide announcements, and then on the back you'll have a sermon outline that you can fill in and take notes. If you're interested in that, they're available to you, so please take advantage of that. Also be sure to note those announcements that are there. Uh, to begin with, we are having our spring fling tonight at 3 o'clock. Is there any particular uh, information that we need there? Anybody want to share anything else about that? Okay, well, we want you to come, I think is what they're saying. And so, so come. It's going to be a wonderful time. Again, very casual and should be, should be a good time of fellowship. It will be at the Hoax Bluff Park, okay? And then afterwards, OCD, which is our off-campus discipleship, is going to start around 5, 5.30 or so. I think 5.30 is what they're, what they're planning on starting. OCD is a great time where you can sit down with people and you get some questions from the sermon and it will get you to think deeper about the text that I preach from. And so you'll be able to share and discuss and be able to pray for one another. Great time to grow in the Lord as well as build some fellowship with other believers. That will also be at the park tonight. I do want to introduce the church also to a new member. And uh, this is uh, a member that has spoken to me recently, and she has a good testimony of faith, and she is joining this church by letter. Her name is Candy Fallon, and so Candy, if you will wave at everybody, there's Candy. And so, we are so grateful to have Candy, and if you are excited to have her to be a part of this church family, would you signify by saying amen? Amen. Praise God. Great to have you, Candy. Be sure to welcome her when you have opportunity to do just that. Is there another word about anything else before we're dismissed? All right. Real quick, a couple of things. Uh, this Wednesday night, this Wednesday night is uh, Giant Games Night. We'll be outside, um, outside the youth room telling everybody to dress warm since we get a little cold spell, but we'll still be outside playing some giant cornhole, giant can jam, stuff like that. If you want to just walk by and see what's going on, love for you to take a look at it. Also, um, to students tonight, uh, our OCD is going to be at Cecilia Smith's home. Look for the remind, um, remind text to let you know the address so you can get out there. And then finally, if your student's going to camp with us, that is June 21st through the 26th at Union University in Jackson, Tennessee. If your student's going with us, I need to know by May 2nd if they're going so I can make sure I get uh, all of our our spots reserved. Um, and that's all I got.
Thank you. Great. Is there another word from anybody else tonight? Okay, Haley. Yes, oh, Jeff. Oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the the kids OCD is at the park, and then if you are a greeter with a shirt, you can meet Haley outside here. Jeff. That's right. Just a quick reminder about next week. Next week is uh, Baptist Men's Day here at the church, and we have a uh, guest worship leader, uh, Jonathan Smith. You guys uh, probably recognize him and, and know him, so he's going to be here. And we have an all male band, all male praise team, all male choir. If we have enough show up. So uh, anyway, it's going to be a great day in the house of the Lord next week. And also, any man and uh, male that wants to participate in that uh, needs to be here on Wednesday night at 7.30 because we're going to begin going through the music. And uh, just to be a part of that, look forward to having you here. And I uh, really would like to see a great participation in that. It's going to be a good time in the Lord. Great. Well, thank you, Brother Jeff. And just a reminder. Over here okay. All right. Thank you, brother. We got some um, shirts for the men uh, over here as well. Baptist Men's Day is open for everybody to come and to worship with us. And so I want to invite everybody to come. It will be a great time of celebration. Is there another word of announcement about anything else? We have several today, a lot going on. Well, God bless you so much for being here, and I'm so grateful for you being here. I hope to see you all this afternoon at 3 o'clock. It's going to be a beautiful day. It'll be some good, clean fellowship and a lot of fun. So let's all stand together, and Jeff and the praise team will lead us in a sing-out. It's when you call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Thank y'all so much.